The purpose of this video is to try and explain a more mathematically sound way of approaching the odometry problem. Specifically, we will be looking at the theoretical accuracy of current approaches and how these can be improved. Before watching this video, I highly encourage you to watch both Puncture 2's Intro to Odometry video and Part 1 of this series. This video will be math heavy. I have tried to make this understandable for someone who has only taken trigonometry. However, we will be using a lot of calculus concepts. After watching, if you still have questions, please leave them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. Let's begin with a recap of what we discussed in the last video. The robot we are modeling has three non-powered wheels. On the robot, we define positive x as forward and positive y as to the left. This matches with how vectors are drawn and the unit circle. A quick refresher on relative movement. Relative movement is the movement in relation to where we were in the last loop. If we moved 14 inches forward from the last loop, then our relative movement is always 14 inches in the relative x direction, regardless of which direction the robot moved globally. Likewise, if we strafe 10 inches to the left, our relative movement will always be 10 inches in the relative y. I will therefore use the words relative x and forward, along with relative y and strafe, interchangeably. Last video, we derived these equations for the relative movement of the robot in each loop. If you want a refresher on how we did that, you can rewatch the previous video. However, in this video, we will assume that you can get these values. We will not focus on how these values are actually calculated. Now we can recap the implementations discussed in the last video. We have already seen that the relative movement of the robot is not equivalent to its global movement. We can fix this by simply rotating the relative movement vectors to be in the direction of the robot heading before adding to the previous location approximation. This is a very good idea and actually perfectly models the robot's movement if the robot moves in straight lines between every loop. However, the robot doesn't actually move in straight lines. A better idea might be that the robot moves in an arc. Arcs are special because they are what happens when something has constant rotational and translational velocity. In other words, if you keep going forward and turning at the same speed, you will make a circle. We can see that the arc assumption models the robot's movements better than the lines. We will discuss how much better when we talk about error analysis later. Now that we have finished the recap, we can begin with our first new topic, the odometry equations. We will start by examining the linear odometry equations. As you already know, by decreasing the time between readings, the value of the linear approximation gets closer to the actual value. What would happen if we made the time between readings infinitesimally small? Don't freak out about these equations. They might appear scary, but they actually denote something relatively straightforward. The speed the robot moves in the global coordinate space is equivalent to the relative speed of the robot rotated to the robot's heading in the global coordinate space. People who have taken calculus may already see where this is going, but if you haven't, you might be looking at this and wondering. That's great, but how does this tell us our location? Position is equal to velocity times time. So we simply need to multiply our velocity by time and we get our answer, right? Congratulations, you just found the mathematical way to arrive at linear odometry. Unfortunately, if we want to go any further than this, we need to use calculus because when the value of our velocity isn't constant, simply multiplying by speed won't give us the correct answer. We need to use an integral. Now at the start of this video, I said we wouldn't be doing calculus, and I wasn't lying. We won't be solving the equations. We will simply be setting them up for now. Here is the equation for constant velocity arcs. Notice that the velocity functions are constant, and that the slope of the heading function is also constant. This is where it gets its name. If you were to integrate this, you would find that it's actually equivalent to the value we found in the last video using a geometric approach. I will leave this as an exercise for the viewer. Now let's look at constant acceleration arcs. Hopefully you notice that the only difference is that we added an acceleration term to both the velocity functions and the heading function. One final thing, the term arc is misleading. If you were to plot this, it would not form an arc, as that is a specific term for a section of the circle. However, I think the use of this term is helpful to demonstrate continuity between higher order approximations which is why we'll continue to use it in this video. Now let's generalize this. As you have hopefully guessed, whenever we go to a higher order approximation, we simply add a new term corresponding to that degree. Great, 
Now we've figured out how to set up the odometry equations for an arbitrarily high degree system. But two questions still remain. How do we solve and what are the constants? I will begin by addressing the former. Now the title card is a little misleading. You cannot actually solve the odometry equations other than the linear and constant Bell arcs. However, we can get a pretty good approximation to the correct answer. As I mentioned earlier, velocity times time is equivalent to the displacement, also known as the distance traveled. When we have a constant velocity, it's easy to see that the area of the graph would be equivalent to the displacement. This is because the area of a rectangle is its width, time, multiplied by its height, velocity. Therefore, the integral of our velocity function is equivalent to our displacement. For those of you who haven't taken calculus, the integral is the area under the curve. In my opinion, this is not an especially helpful definition for someone who hasn't already taken calculus. A different way of explaining this is if we split our displacement calculations into many small velocity times times calculations, we get an increasingly accurate approximation of the total displacement because the rectangles better fill out the area under the curve. When we increase the number of summations to infinity, that is an integral. We don't actually need to know what the integral is though. We just need to know that we can estimate it by making an approximation of the curve using functions we do know the integrals for. In this case, we'll be approximating the velocity functions using lots of parabolas and taking the integral of those. This is known as Simpson's rule if you want to find out more about it. For this video, we won't cover how this approximation works, only that it does, and it gives us a pretty good answer. Great, now we just apply Simpson's rule to the odometry equations and we can solve it. Now we just need to figure out the coefficients for the odometry equations. A concept we first must understand is interpolation. Interpolation is the process of creating a curve that goes through all the points in a list exactly. This is different from regression, like the line of best fit, where we just get a function that matches the data closely. With interpolation, we literally go through every point. All we require for this video is that there is something called the Lagrange Interpolating Polynomial, or LIP. The LIP is the minimum degree polynomial that goes through every point in the graph. Why is this helpful? Because we can extract the velocity, acceleration, and all other higher order terms through using an LIP. All we need to do is store the robot's forward, strafe, and turn values from n previous loops along with their times, where n is the degree we are trying to match. We then find the LIP that goes through all the data points and extract the coefficients from that. Great, we have successfully found the coefficients for determining our theta of t, rel x of t, and rel y of t. Before you get too excited and start doing constant snap, crackle, and pop odometry, there are a few disclaimers I need to make. Firstly, when you make too high an order of an LIP, you can get what is called Runge's phenomenon. This is basically when your LIP explodes. You can imagine that this would be bad for our odometry. We don't want our robot to randomly teleport away from where it should be. Secondly, the assumption we are making is that over these n plus one different loops, the value of our n order coefficient is constant. So for example, if we are doing constant jerk, the third derivative of position, we would be assuming that over the past four loops, our jerk was the same value. You can probably guess that as the number becomes larger, it becomes less and less true. Because of these reasons, I cannot recommend going higher than a constant jerk localizer. With that aside, we have successfully solved odometry. Why is the video not over? Because we have yet to answer the simple question, why? The short answer is because it's better. The long answer begins with us discussing error analysis. When discussing error, we use the notation O of h to the n to represent the relationship between error and loop time. For instance, if the relationship is O of h, then if we have loop times, we will have the error. This continues for O of h squared, where if we have loop time, we will quarter the error. Hopefully, just based on that example, you understand why we want n to be as large as possible. But to put it simply, the larger n gets, the less error we get. Now let's examine how the previous methods we had in FTC compare to the new ones. As you can see, the newer methods are significantly more accurate based on my testing. If you want to verify my tests, you can look at the GitHub repo in the description. 
Notice that both the linear and constant velocity arcs are the same order. Does this mean they are both equally as good? No. They converge to zero error at the same rate, but the errors for constant velocity arcs are about 10% lower than that of lines, and therefore you should always be using the constant velocity arcs over lines when given the opportunity. Unfortunately, a detailed overview of the testing methodology would take too long, but the basics are that I would find the error with a certain number of loops, then double it and see what the ratio of these values of error converge to. I also think that the value of constant jerk being O of H to the 3.225 is due to deficiencies with how I tested it. In theory, it should be O of H to the fourth accurate. I would like to thank everyone who has managed to watch this far into the video. There is a link to the Clueless Center Stage repository in the description. They used the constant acceleration arcodometry code at Worlds this year, so I'm fairly certain it works well. With that being said, I don't think odometry is the end-all be-all of localization. All the extra accuracy we found from the math can just as easily be eliminated with a single instant of the odometry wheel coming off the ground or some slightly poorly tuned odometry wheel locations. With that all in mind, here are some tips on how to improve localization accuracy. Make sure the odometry is physically good. When you push them into the robot, they should immediately come out. They should never feel gummy. Also, if you can wiggle them, that's a big issue. Merge data from other sensors. Effective sensor merging is good for correcting for global error while keeping the high precision of odometry. Make sure you merge intelligently though. If you have an ultrasonic or April tag, try only merging when you're going slowly or adjust the weight to be lower when the robot is going faster. Additionally, it's very important to time correct the data. If you don't, you could be merging data from 100 milliseconds ago into the robot's current movement. And if you're moving, that could be several inches out of date. Decrease loop times. This can be done by simply bulk reading and only calling hardware one time per loop. If you have any sensors that you aren't actively using, don't call them. And if you don't need data from them every loop, try only calling them once every 100 milliseconds. Or, if you want to be fancy, you can implement a system like the priority queue that the Clueless uses. That's all for this video. Hopefully it was helpful. Again, please look at the Clueless Center Stage repository for inspiration.